you run a blood test. Oh, look, your LDL is high. Take this drug. You don't have to, you can have an IQ of 80 and do that. But in order to have smart medicine, smart healthcare, dive into what's causing it. I've been saying for a few weeks now on my YouTube channel that LDL is part of the immune system. And so is HDL, C-reactive protein, lipoprotein A, insulin, high blood glucose. All of these factors are known to be diagnostic of heart disease or diabetes. Now, there are exceptions to this. There's the familial hypercholesterolemia. These are people who have genetically high cholesterol. And if they survive through their 50s and they make it to their 80s, then they die less. They have less cancer, less infections, etc. That's one subset of high cholesterol. Another one is lean mass hyperresponders. And this group of people are thin and they exercise a lot and they have high cholesterol because of genetics and the way that they're using their body for athleticism. This graphic right here is from a study that was just released and it shows in the purple lines that go up and down on the far left. Those are people with lean, the lean mass hyperresponders. They have very high uh, LDL cholesterol. You can see that number is averaging between 200 and 300 and some of these people have LDL uh, over 500. And then the yellow blocks show the amount of coronary artery calcification that they have um, as seen on a CT scan. And compare that to the graphic that's in the middle, it's, there's a green line and the LDL is much lower. These are other people, another group, and we can see the comparison. And their average LDL, I think it was 123. And then they have the yellow stocked blocks showing about equivalent amount of calcification in their arteries out of these, I think it was 80 people on both sides. So this shows that in this group of people who are lean mass hyperresponders, they can have crazy high LDL and they do not get a significant uh, increase in their uh, calcification in their arteries or atherosclerosis. As a matter of fact, they have a little bit less than the people with lower LDL. So this is just a subset of people who demonstrate high LDL with no excess placking. And then you have another group of people that I said, um, familial hyper, hypercholesterolemia. They have high LDL and they have more placking in their younger years, middle, middle age years. But I'm going to show you another group of people with infections. And that causes high LDL. LDL is for the immune system. And you'll see that I have all these examples of people with infections. Maybe they're in the hospital. They have septicemia. Maybe they have pneumonia. They're at home. They have a candida. They have mold in their home. And they have higher LDL, higher total cholesterol for the immune system. This article shows that LDL acts as an opsonin. What is an opsonin? In the ancient Greek or Latin uh, etymology of the word, like where it comes from, it means to prepare a meal for one. So it's like a chef. They're preparing a meal for you. They're setting plates and they put the meal right there on the table and you eat it up. That's what LDL does for phagocytes, part of the white blood cells to, and your immune system to kill off organisms. And in this article, they're testing LDL against streptococcus. And this right here is kind of a big deal. And when you look up opsonin on uh, Google Chrome uh, AI and you say, give me examples of opsonins, it will also indicate C-reactive protein. Now we know C-reactive protein is considered an inflammatory marker and it measures the amount of inflammation and disease occurring right inside the, the inside of the arteries. Well, C-reactive protein is part of the immune system. It's an opsonin. It's trying to tackle organisms and make them get eaten by phagocytes. So the point here is that there are organisms inside the arteries causing disease and atherosclerosis, and the uh, LDL and C-reactive protein are trying to fix the problem. But when you have high LDL or high C-reactive protein, it's thought that those are the problems. They're not. They're trying to fix the problem. The problem is an infection. This article states that you can have um, an acute infection and it raises insulin and causes insulin resistance. So insulin resistance, quote unquote, diabetes is a side effect of some infections. And I've known this for 20 years that parasites can be infecting the pancreas and that can, and I saved children before from having type one diabetes by making them poop out parasites. And then their insulin sensitivity comes back to normal and um, they don't have type one diabetes anymore. This article says the effect of inflammation and infection on lipids and lipoproteins. There's just a lot here, and you can read through it. All of these references will be below in the show notes. And in this article, they talk about various infective autoimmune conditions. Now, it was known back in the 1930s, 40s, and 50s that autoimmune conditions are caused by an infection. But we, we seem to have forgotten that, and that's very sad because we have drugs that treat symptoms, but they're not treating the infection. So here we have rheumatoid arthritis, systemic lupus, and psoriasis. These are caused by organisms and it can change the uh, lipids and raise LDL and do all these things. And uh, I currently have a patient with multiple sclerosis and she's pooping out parasites every single day. And now she can um, bend her foot up, dorsiflex, and she can extend her hamstring uh, by a couple inches. So her right leg was completely paralyzed before that. And then her um, LDL cholesterol has been very high, but she's been on a very low carb diet for many years. So her triglycerides are very low, which is really good. But I know that her LDL is high because she's got 
parasites and her immune system is in um, overdrive uh, going after these organisms. But of course, her medical doctors aren't looking for parasites. MDs don't look for parasites. I don't know why. But the other organisms that can affect the body, um, besides parasites, would be fungus, mold, um, chronic bacteria, uh, viruses, yeast, and uh, Lyme disease, Lyme organisms that live inside the cells. So conventional medicine is really good with the acute bacterial infections, but they're missing all these other things throughout the whole profession. In the rest of this document, we have periodontal disease, and that absolutely is a major problem. I did a video recently where I talk about several patients who have an infected tooth and a lot of pus coming out once the dentist drilled through that tooth, and that was probably the cause of their high blood glucose and other situations where a patient had symptoms of high blood glucose caused by yeast, for example. Here, this talks about increased lipoprotein A. When I had mold in 2016, my lipoprotein A was double what it should have been. It should be below 75, and mine was at 131 or so. And it says uh, lipoprotein A can go up due to inflammation. And certainly the mycotoxins from mold cause tremendous inflammation, tremendous pain. Look, even lipoprotein A is an opsonin. It enhances the phagocytosis of haemophilus influenza by macrophages. So as a summary for the study, it says beneficial effects of lipoprotein. They redistribute nutrients to immune cells that are important in host defense, and they bind endotoxins. That means or, uh, toxins that come from bacteria. They bind lipotechoic acid, viruses, and other biological agents and prevent their toxic effects. They bind urate crystals, which is a side effect of too much sugar in the, in the diet. They also bind and target parasites for destruction. And then apolipoproteins neutralize viruses, and apolipoproteins lyse parasites. I've had pa patients eliminate parasites into the toilet weekly since 2007. Like that's been like a major story within my career since 07 when I really figured this out. Every week I get some crazy story about parasites coming out of somebody and it's missed so much in the medical profession and maybe that's why lipoprotein A is high. And the more infections you have throughout your body, the more likely you'll have a heart attack. I'll show you plenty of studies that verify that. This study says infection and inflammation induce LDL oxidation in vivo in the body. What that means is LDL is okay unless it's oxidized. And then there's a thing that wraps around LDL, it's called ApoB, and that's okay unless it's oxidized. When I say oxidized, it's like rusted, like your car is okay until it's really rusty and it causes, you know, it's damaged. And the damaged LDL, the damaged ApoB cause problems to your body, they can cause heart disease. But what causes the oxidation of LDL? Well, infection can do it and inflammation can do it. So that's what this article is saying. And the standard answer from cardiology is just lower LDL. That's all you gotta do, whether you exercise, take drugs or um, change your diet to a vegan diet, just crush the LDL down and boom, you're done. Everything is solved, but it's not that simple. There's so many other causes of bad LDL or high LDL that's oxidized. There's also the big fluffy LDL, which is really good for the immune system. And then there's a, the small dense LDL that's really bad and it's damaged uh, to the body. And the small dense LDL is not natural in the body. It's gotta be caused by something. Seed oils can do that. And um, infection and inflammation can do that. This study says LDL acts as an opsonin, enhancing the phagocytosis of group A strep. This study says severity, duration, and mechanisms of insulin resistance during acute infections. Another exploration as to why somebody might have insulin resistance, aka diabetes. Could be infection. This is a YouTube video with a group of researchers, and they published a study. It says how infection causes diabetes. And at the end of this video right here, they talk about how insulin is a signaler to make the immune system go after viruses. So insulin can activate the immune system. Here's a study how viruses can make uh, glucose go up and cause hyper or hypoglycemia. And in the study, they quote the earlier research I showed you on that YouTube video right here. This is super interesting. It says apolipoprotein B is an innate barrier against invasive staph aureus infection. So there's a term called pleomorphism. So you can have organisms that are friendly, but then the environment changes, changes in the body and then they become unfriendly pathogenic and they cause problems in the body that cause disease. So Staph aureus is a friendly organism until it's not, and it'll convert to being pathogenic. And in this, it says, we show that VLDL and LDL lipoproteins interfere with this switch from friendly to not by antagonizing the Staph aureus, blah, 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 blah. So it prevents the pleomorphic changes that can occur um, and causing disease. Super interesting. The study says antimicrobial activity of lipoprotein particles containing apolipoprotein A1. And it's saying that HDL, inhibited bacterial growth throughout 21 hours of incubation. And so they tested different lipoproteins and they all were antimicrobial at the beginning. Uh, one of them flipped to being pro-microbial, but HDL was antimicrobial throughout. It says these results indicated that the antimicrobial activity was associated with the APO A1 AI-containing lipoprotein particles 
uh, parentheses HDL. So HDL, very antimicrobial. Here's a great, here's a great study. It says high cholesterol may protect against infections and atherosclerosis. It says an endotoxin, uh, like lipopolysaccharide is the name of the endotoxin, the main pathogenic factor of gram-negative bacteria, binds rapidly to lipoproteins, meaning mainly LDL. So LDL will grab onto this toxin. And lipoprotein-bound endotoxin is unable to activate the secretion of various cytokines, activating the immune system because the LDL grabbed onto it and prevented it from causing any damage. This is quite an extensive, and it's a great study. Lots of information. Here's a table showing all these other studies, like explaining their point. At the bottom, there's a conclusion, and it says there's a couple of reasons why that you get this inflammation uh, to the arteries. And the first one involves uh, immune system activation induced by simply having too much cholesterol. I don't really buy into that. The second pathway involves direct stimulation of the endothelium, the inside of the artery, by a number of factors, including smoking, diabetes, hyperhomocysteine, too, so too much of that uh, nutri uh, nutrient called homocysteine, too much iron, too, much, uh, too little copper, oxidized cholesterol, and then microorganisms. So any of those can infiltrate and attack the endothelium of the arteries. And then uh, there's much evidence to support roles for these factors, but th the degree to which e each of them participates remains uncertain. Most of all, the fact that high cholesterol predicts longevity rather than mortality in old people suggests that the role, if any, of high cholesterol must be trivial. So these other factors that they listed are probably a bigger issue than just having high cholesterol, high LDL. The most likely explanation for these findings is that rather than promoting atherosclerosis, high cholesterol may be protective, possibly through its beneficial influence on the immune system. So when you have somebody who's 50 years old and they're creating a lot of plaque, they have heart disease, it's an infection. And it's got to be taken care of correctly. Just taking antibiotics is not good enough because it's a long-term process. And I'm going to go through some studies showing how the more infections somebody has, the worse off their heart disease is. So it had mentioned about older people having a longer lifespan with high LDL. Here's the study. Lack of an association or an inverse association between LDL cholesterol and mortality in the elderly. And this one says plasma lipoproteins are important components of the immune system. And it just goes on and on. It's fantastic. Anti-infective activity of oxidized LDL. So even oxidized LDL, the quote-unquote worst kind of LDL, it's still anti-infective. It's still part of the immune system. And then possible anti-invasive activity of the lipoprotein A. That's supposed to be worse than LDL. But it's actually beneficial for the immune system. And here's all these pathogens that have known to have some kind of an effect on HDL and LDL and oxidized LDL. So all these studies right here. This study says obese visceral fat tissue inflammation from protective to detrimental. So the idea here, I'm not going to get deep into it, is that it's not normal to have visceral fat in your abdomen. It's evolutionary. It didn't happen. It rarely ever happened. And when it does, your body treats it like an infection. So lose that weight, um, go into ketosis, go in a, on the high satiety diet at dietdoctor.com. So when you go on a ketogenic diet or low-carbohydrate diet and your LDL goes up, statin therapy is not warranted for a person with high LDL cholesterol on a low-carbohydrate diet. But if you're on the high-carbohydrate diet, you're eating the standard American diet, drinking pop, eating french fries, eating bread, pasta, and your LDL goes up, then go on a statin drug. You have to. That's your punishment for eating the wrong diet. And I know everybody's doing it, and uh, holidays come up, birthdays come up, and there's cake, and there's ice cream, and there's all kinds of junk food. And if you keep eating that way consistently and your LDL goes up, then you take statin drugs because they're anticoagulative, they're antifungal, and they promote viscosity of the blood. They're anti-inflammatory. Whether they drop your LDL by five points or 40 points, it doesn't matter. Statin drugs work not because they lower LDL. It's because of the other four factors that I just mentioned. But if you're on a low-carb diet and your LDL goes up, don't worry about it. That's the big fluffy LDL. It's very good for your immune system. But when you're on a junk food diet, and your LDL goes up, that's the bad kind of LDL. It's small and it, it's dense, and it's not natural for the body to have small, dense LDL. Here's another study. Atherosclerosis, the involvement of immunity, cytokines and cells, and pathogenesis. And you can read through that. Just, it's very extensive. It's fantastic. Evidence of nanobacterial-like structures in calcified human arteries and cardiac valves. So you can have normal-sized bacteria and normal-sized viruses, parasites, whatever. But this is nanobacteria. They're 50 times smaller than bacteria. And they're recently discovered, 1998, maybe earlier, but um, they can be causing plaquing and then calcification in arteries and valves, and meaning heart valves. Detection of nanobacteria like particles in human atherosclerotic plaques. Association between antibodies against calcifying nanoparticles and mitral annular calcification. So these all have to do with these nanoparticles. Association between self-replicating calcifying nanoparticles and aortic stenosis, a possible link to valve calcification. So there's a variety of infections. So I've mentioned bacteria, I've mentioned parasites, I've mentioned nanoparticles, nanobacteria, and I've mentioned visceral fat. So when I say that um, heart disease could be from an infection, there's a huge definition of what an infection is. It's not just acute bacterial that needs 
you know, doxycycline for seven days. That's not, that's not what it is. It's a process of revitalizing tissue and draining out dead tissue, which I'll get into at the very end. Here's the role of calcifying nanoparticles in biology and medicine. This study says role of oral bacterial flora in calcific aortic stenosis in animal models. So now we're talking about teeth. And this is from 2004. Here's a book from Dr. Weston A. Price. And this is from the 1920s. He was the president of the American Dental Association. He did a lot of studies where he took bad teeth out of a human and then inserted it under the skin of a rabbit. And the rabbit developed the same disease that the human had because that disease was carried in the tooth. So it's another type of or location for an infection. Here's a great study. Plasma lipoproteins as crucial components of host defense against infections. This is from June of 2016. And it's just extensive. So much great information. Viral infections, bacterial, parasitic, anti-effective properties of mechanisms of lipoproteins. Inhibiting the entry of intracellular pathogens into host cells. So now we're talking about a little bit about Lyme disease. When I say Lyme, I mean organisms that live inside the cells. So these lipoproteins like LDL can inhibit the entry of these pathogens into the cells and they can inactivate the effect of microbial toxins. All microbes release toxins. And can you get rid of that? Do you suffer from those toxins? And it says lysis of pathogens and then promoting opsonization, which is preparing the organism to be consumed by phagocytes, redistribution of lipids to immune cells. So LDL is a protein, low dense lipoprotein, and it carries fat, it carries lipids. So lipids is a source of energy. And when you go into ketosis, you're burning lipids, you're burning fat. So your immune cells need energy. And it could be why LDL goes up or it could be why blood glucose goes up. Either way, they need to be fed. Now it's not at all as clean as what you may think. So it says lipoproteins is double-edged sword of the immune system. So just like in any battle, you can have somebody defect to the other side. You can have somebody act as a spy. And this is what happens with uh, lipoproteins and um, other factors related to lipids. You can have this, like this parasite right here, Toxoplasma gondii, that's from cats, is dependent on uh, host cholesterol, so the body's cholesterol from LDL for growth and replication. So that parasite uses your LDL to eat. So it's not pretty. It's not like all clean, like, oh, your LDL is always going to kill every single organism. No, it's not like that. It's, it's a battle going on inside our body. And we have defectors and we have um, little bits of Antifa running around trying to cause harm. And then we have the good guys and they can turn to bad guys. We can have bad guys turn to good guys. And the best thing you could do is detox your body, clean it up of chemicals and metals. I have a study coming up about cadmium, lead, mercury, et cetera. But clean your body out. Get your tissues as viable as possible. Um, make your tissues healthy and get the parasites out. Uh, make the drainage occur. Um, I have the whole seven-step blueprint to optimal health. So there's seven step you, steps you take. And every time I go through these studies, I can see what part of the seven steps need to occur in order for um, optimal health. Here it says a large number of viruses can hijack the host lipid and lipoprotein machinery to their benefit. Here's one that says infusion of lipoproteins in volunteers can enhance growth of candida. Okay, so we're gonna talk about a series of infections that can trigger a heart attack. This says triggering of acute myocardial infection by respiratory infection. And then down here it says the relative risk for myocardial inf infarction occurring within one to seven days after respiratory infection. Symptoms was 17. So that's huge. Now when you have a vegetarian say that bacon causes heart disease, the relative risk there is like 1.3. It's barely, it's almost negligible. It's almost 1.0, which means no effect whatsoever. But for, if you had an acute infection, your relative risk is 17. Like that's tremendous. Here it says, here it says severe infections and subsequent delayed cardiovascular disease. The risk is highest during the first year after the infection with an adjusted hazard ratio of 6.33. That's crazy high. So if you have an infection, I don't care, bacteremia, you know, sepsis, these are bad ones, pneumonia in the lungs an infected wound somewhere in your extremities, your chance of having a heart attack goes up. You got to clean that up, get your immune system strong, get off the junk food, get off the alcohol, and do healthy things to repair your tissue. This says risk of myocardial infarction and stroke after acute infection or vaccination. So it says after systemic respiratory tract infection, the risks were highest for the first three days, which is 4.95, so relative risk, basically 5.0, crazy high. And then the risk for stroke, 3.19. Here it says risk for myocardial infarction and stroke after community-acquired bacteremia, so bacteria in the blood, a 20-year population-based cohort study. And it said, this is crazy high. The risk for myocardial infarction or stroke was greatly increased within 30 days of community-acquired bacteremia, and the relative risk was 20.86. So again, not 1.5, not 2.0, 20, basically 21. So don't get an infection. Easier said than done. 
Longitudinal study of the effects of bacteremia and sepsis on five-year risk of cardiovascular events. Here these numbers are lower, so 1.52 and 2.39. But if you had a previous uh, sepsis, then it goes way up to 6.91. This one talks about infections may be a trigger for heart attack, stroke, and it gives some good statistics of the heart disease patients, about 37%, had some type of infection within the previous three months. Among stroke patients, it was nearly 30%. Infections substantially increased the odds of having a heart attack or stroke compared to a year or two earlier in the same group of patients, and those odds were highest in the first two weeks following the infection. Here's an, here's an amazing uh, article from Circulation, and this is from July of 1999. It's quite extensive, but there's one sentence I want to show you. I'll read it off. And it goes on and on about immune responses to the vessel wall and pathogens and inflammation, pathogen burden as a determinant of elevated C-reactive protein. So summary and conclusions, it was appreciated many years ago that atherosclerosis does not progress as a slow, gradual process. Rather, the underlying progressive nature of the disease is punctuated by intermittent acute exacerbations. That's brilliant. And this is true for all uh, chronic infections because they can come and go based on various factors, such as the full moon with parasites. Parasites are more active during the full moon. And then nighttime, mold is more active. And if you're stressed out, if you have an exposure to some chemical smell, if you ate the wrong food, if there's a storm coming and the weather changes and the air is more humid, all these factors make your lungs worse or your knees worse, the knee pain. It can make your breathing worse. You know, it can make um, you feel more tired, more depressed, sleep more, sleep less. And these are all organisms changing their behavior based on the external environment. So same thing with uh, atherogenesis here. It's an infection commonly, and it can be stable, and it can grow in spurts, and then stable again, and then grow in spurts. So that makes sense. And here's how they describe it. What happens, infection causes an immune response. You get Th1 and Th2. Th stands for T helper cells. These are the, some kinds of white blood cells. And then uh, they become monocytes, macrophages, types of cells, T cells, B cells. All these are white blood cells basically for the immune system. And here you get inflammation, and over here you get autoimmune response, and then therefore you get atherosclerosis. This article says infections, atherosclerosis, and coronary heart disease. I'm showing you this because I don't know who else talks about this. I watch a lot of YouTube. I watch a lot of cardiologists and medical doctors, holistic, conventional. Um, I, I get their interpretations of the PubMed research. Nobody talks about infections being a cause of heart disease. I think this is probably a greater cause of heart disease than anything else. And the reason why I say that is because junk food destroys your tissue. And now you have dead tissue. Organisms eat the dead tissue. That's their food. And then your immune system activates to kill the organisms. But as you eat more and more junk food, you get more and more dead tissue. You're killing yourself. You're destroying your body's tissues, the structure of your body. And then there's this like process where, where your immune system is trying to clean that up so you can regrow normal, viable tissue. So with the study, we start with the pathogens. Here's the various pathogens here. And then it goes into the lesion formation. And what happens with the immune system? Migration and proliferation of smooth muscle cells. Then the rupture of the lesion, thrombosis and plaque instability. And then you get a heart attack. So a heart attack is um, certainly something you want to avoid. But just equally as bad, but longer term, is congestive heart failure. So that can go on for many, many years. And it's more common than having a heart attack. Now, as far as the therapy, it says the vast majority of anti-infective studies have focused on C. pneumonia. So that organism is what they're trying to treat as far as like helping out the arteries. But there could be hundreds or thousands of different organisms that cause the same process to occur in your arteries. It's not just bacterial. It could be many other types of organisms, and each one acts differently. So when you go, that's the allopathic model, is to go after that one organism. It's that silver bullet uh, philosophy, which was um, sort of coined in the 1820s. It became really popular around 1850. But that doesn't work when it comes to chronic disease. Heart disease is a chronic disease. It's more re revitalizing the body due to sunset blueprint optimal health. So this one says inflammation, infection, and atherosclerosis. Statin drugs are antifungal. I mentioned that before, and here we go. Here's a study on that. Fungus is something I think that medicine is very poor at finding and fixing. Okay, this one talks about mold and mycotoxin exposure, raising LDL. This one talks about acute cholesterol responses to mental stress and change in posture. So just having poor posture can raise your cholesterol, and having mental stress can raise your cholesterol. It's not just genetic. This one says high cholesterol levels and chronic exposure to toxigenic molds in damp buildings, I had a high risk for cardiovascular diseases and stroke. So I'm going to say it again. When I had black mold in 2016, my lipoprotein A was double what it should have been. And I did have an EKG in August of 2016 in Florida. It was humid. My heart was bouncing around, really painful. And the EKG showed possible MI. They did the troponin test. My troponin was normal, so therefore I did not have a heart attack. But man, it certainly did feel like it. 
so it was these the learning that I got from my own bad health from the moldy uh, building that I was in um, that can be extrapolated to a lot of other people who have bad hearts and they could have it could be a fungus it could be a parasite they have to clean up their diet they got to clean up their body and you can't just squash LDL just squashing LDL is not the solution study shows possible link between air pollution and higher cholesterol levels the impact of environmental toxins on cardiovascular disease so it's not just infection it's toxins air pollution chemical toxins and here we have more chemical toxins these are the forever chemicals per and polyfluoroalkylene substances and um, the like Teflon and when they get in the water they never uh, disintegrate they're always in the water so if you ate some Teflon pan with your scrambled eggs 25 years ago the Teflon's still inside your body nothing can get it out and that can affect your cholesterol levels and it says right here in the discussion PFOA and PFOS were significantly associated with total cholesterol and LDL levels in adults this is the kind of study that I don't really like it's a large epidemiological study with a food survey but it's saying that people who have an allergic reaction to dairy have a greater cardiovascular mortality if you have an allergic reaction to dairy. So what causes that? Usually parasites. Sometimes it's genetic, but parasites cause dairy allergies. Now this one's about heavy metals. Contaminant metals as cardiovascular risk factors. A scientific statement from the American Heart Association, and this year is June of 2023, and it goes through uh, lead, cadmium, um, arsenic, and then sources, old paint, soil, where they land, respiratory tract, established biomarkers. So these metals can cause problems because they accumulate in the liver, kidneys, and other soft tissues, and they can render enzymes and proteins dysfunctional. And now you have dead tissue. What happens when you have dead tissue? The organisms grow and they eat the dead tissue. Now you have an infection. And then your immune system activates. Your LDL goes up. And um, you can't blame the LDL for what the heavy metals are doing or for what the chemicals are doing or for what your diet is doing. LDL is trying to help. I mentioned the statin drugs and what they're beneficial for. Now, this is a new form of statin drug. It's called PCSK9 inhibitors. And when I looked up what is a PCSK9, what is that? It's part of the immune system. So this statin drug inhibits the PCSK9. So therefore, your immune system gets weaker. And this can lower LDL or cholesterol way down and not have all the negative effects of the older generation of statin drugs. But now that your immune system is weaker, what does that mean? Well, it means increased risk of asthma and Crohn's disease. This is my last piece of research. It's from Johns Hopkins, 2005. Yeast finding links processes in heart disease and cancer. And I highlighted this sentence right here. The researchers discovered that a gene that helps the organism, the yeast, make cholesterol also helps it survive when oxygen is scarce. This is all about lactic acidosis. If you're a longtime watcher of my videos, you'll know that when you have low oxygen in your blood, it will convert the body it's part of the process of converting the body to using fermentation to make energy. So instead of using fats and uh, the mitochondrial function and what's called oxidative phosphorylation, which is very effective, very efficient, um, very prolific with the energy production. But when you're sick, you have low oxygen. Instead of using your mitochondria, you start making energy outside of the mitochondria in the cytoplasm of the cell. And that's called fermentation. You can, let, you can ferment lactate, you can ferment alcohol, and you can ferment, ferment a couple other things. But that's part of the disease process. It's, as a matter of fact, it's called cachexia, also known as death. It's the, it's the death cycle. So when this yeast has low oxygen, it makes cholesterol. So when people are dying, they're having uh, heart disease, they're overweight, they're getting diabetes, they're 65, 70, 75, 80 years old, they're getting sicker and sicker. They have less and less oxygen in their body. Therefore, if this correlates with humans, Therefore, they'll have more cholesterol. So instead of trying to just squash the LDL cholesterol down using drugs, you got to get to the source. You got to do the seven step blueprint to optimal health. I want to show you a couple of graphics that I've made. Up here it says on the upper left the mechanism of heart disease. You have junk food and seed oils, they destroy tissue. Organisms clean up that tissue. The organisms emit biofilm and mucus. You add in calcium phosphate and dead tissue, you get this mineralizable matrix and it becomes calcified. It's called dystrophic calcification. The calcification of soft tissue causes atherosclerosis and heart valves become calcified. Um, bone spurs, kidney stones, gallstones, and soft tissue becomes stiff. So your neck gets stiff, your low back gets stiff. And to reverse that, stop the processed food, eat real food and real meat, revive the tissue, add antimicrobial herbs, enzymes to break up the biofilm, 
drainage of dead tissue and revive the tissue. So you're going to nourish the, the tissue and you're, you're going to drain out the um, biofilm and mucus. And then some kind of a supplement to break up the calcification, like an EDTA derivative, some kind of a binder detox product. Here's another graphic. It goes in a circle. So we have avoid meat. This is what we're told to do. Avoid meat, use plant oils and, and uh, go vegetarian, vegan, use just plants to keep your LDL down. The seed oil is damaged tissue and eating less protein weakens your immune system. Your immune system is just all protein. It's the membranes, it's the capillaries, the lymphatic um, vessels, lymph nodes, um, white blood cells, I mean, red blood cells. Your body's made out of protein. And when you don't eat enough meat, you get a lack of protein and then you get problems. Damaged and dead tissue are eaten up by pathogens. LDL is antimicrobial, so it goes up to kill the pathogens. Statin drugs prescribed by the MD to force the LDL down. Pathogens flourish create biofilm to live in, the immune system turns biofilm into stone, arteriosclerosis, stone arthritis, aging, the solution is eat meat and avoid seed oils. So it's kind of the same story. I just did it in a circle, added a little bit to it. And check out this next one, because this is very interesting also. This is my last slide. Thanks for sticking around. And it says here in the upper left, when people don't eat enough meat, they end up eating junk food uh, with the seed oils. 57% of Americans' calories are junk food and 72% of grocery stores are junk food. MD say avoid meat and use seed oils to keep LDL down. The seed oil is damaged tissue and oxidized LDL, and that weakens the immune system. Protein is what's needed to keep your capillaries strong, your lymphatic tissue strong, white blood cells, et cetera, et cetera, your, your membranes and your immune system. Chronic pathogens flourish when your immune system is weak from this bad diet. But now we're going to go, we have two arrows. This one says chronic pathogens flourish, and in response to infection, insulin and blood glucose go up. And then therefore, you get a diagnosis of diabetes. But over here, we have in response to infection, HDL lowers. And there's an increase in LDL, ApoB, lipoprotein A, triglycerides, total cholesterol, VLDL. And then you get a diagnosis from a cardiologist that you have heart disease. It's the same thing. It just depends on who you see. If you see an endocrinologist, you got diabetes. And if you have uh, these other problems are gonna, and you see a cardiologist, you have heart disease. It's the same thing. So the solution is Mediterranean diet and drugs doesn't work. They don't fix any of this earlier stuff. Mediterranean diet is high carb. There's, uh, it's a low fat, low meat diet and it does not strengthen your immune system, and it's a disaster at trying to lose weight. So the solution is predominantly meat diet. I'm a big fan of dietdoctor.com forward slash satiety. When you eat foods that are high satiety, they make you happy sooner, you end up eating less food, and you don't starve, and you're not like overindulging in anything because you're eating foods that are uh, perfectly satisfying for your body. I'm a big fan of that. I've been using it for three years on my patients. I also apply ketogenesis for some people, and then fasting, and there's other variations of of diets that are uh, appropriate for certain people. But if I were to just to give a general rule for the whole United States, it would be the high satiety diet at dietdoctor.com. So this information changes everything about healthcare. So um, the majority of people who have chronic disease are diagnosed with diabetes or heart disease, and they're given drugs. The average person who's age 65 or older, I think they're on eight medications now. And never once have they been given the correct information as to why those numbers are off on their blood test. And if you have high LDL, I'm not saying it's off. I'm saying that there's some kind of an organism inside your body that needs to go away. And you can't just take drugs for that. You got to do the holistic approach and revitalize the body. So I'm going to refer to this video many times into the future so people can understand uh, what's going on with their chronic health condition. And uh, so save this, uh, send it to other people. But uh, yeah, I'm, I'm making this video for my own sake because I'm going to share this with my patients. And it's valuable data. It's taken me weeks to compile all this information. And the reason why I started to study this information is because in a few months, I'll be on stage speaking at a conference. There's going to be 150 medical doctors in the room. And I speak for 45 minutes on the benefits of eating meat, the ketogenic or carnivore diet. Then after that, it's 45 minutes from a vegan talking about how meat is bad and plants are good. And then we sit down and we debate each other for an hour and we take questions from the audience. So I've been jumping into why do vegans say the things they say? Now, I've been studying what they say since 2017. So I got that under control. But there's been a bunch of doctors on TikTok I'm watching and they see the and they say the wildest things about just crushing LDL, using uh, seed oil, you know, go ahead, you know, go ahead and eat the high carbohydrate noodles and, and avoid meat. And it's like, why are they saying that? Don't they know the, st the science? Don't they know, you know, standard um, human food? And they don't because PubMed teaches them one way. And they have randomized cl clinical control trials, the best science of the best science, showing that high LDL causes heart disease. But they're missing. It's not. That's not it. There's all these other factors that make high, you know, LDL go up. So I just mentioned all the chemicals, the, the toxins, the metals, the organisms, it's, and, and stress, et cetera, can make LDL go up. Visceral fat can make it go up. So we just have to be smarter. Throughout all of medicine, we have to be smarter because in just crushing LDL, that's like fifth grade 
work. A fifth grader can do that. You run a blood test. Oh, look, your LDL is high. Take this drug. You don't have to, you can have an IQ of 80 and do that. But in order to have smart medicine, smart healthcare, dive into what's causing it. What are the toxins and organisms behind that? So if you want help from me, you can contact my office. The best way to contact us is through phone. You can also send an email, go to our website, and keep studying. 